Has your brother locked your way to steal your kingdom? Has your cousin beat you to the treasury and stolen your crown? Have you succumbed to illness and predeceased your father, the king? Hi, I'm Veronica Fortune. Past is the podcast about those who would never rule. Please join me to hear the stories of the almost kings and queens of history. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 6, Two Philips, Two Charles, and Many Jacques. Today we will finally get acquainted with our first Valois Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Bold. But before we get Philip comfortably seated in Dijon, we have to find out why he was known as the Bold and close the book on the Capetian House of Burgundy. We finished our last episode with John the Good marching south after driving off an English invasion of Normandy, hoping to do the same to another English invasion of southwest France. John's rival here was Edward the Black Prince, son of Edward III, and every bit his father's son. Edward was in the midst of a chevouche, or a campaign of destruction. The Chevouche was a mainstay of English tactics during the Hundred Years' War, and whenever I mention an English campaign through France, chances are it's a Chevouche. These campaigns were brutal. Every village, hamlet, farm, and town was utterly destroyed. Everything that could be carried off was, and everything that couldn't was burned or smashed to bits. While the destruction of Chevouches were supposed to be limited to property and not include that of the church, these rules were more often than not ignored, and rape, murder, and looting of churches were all common. So when I say that the Black Prince was cutting a swath of destruction through southern France, I mean that literally. This was a campaign of terror, and anyone left alive was left with nothing. No food, no shelter, and nothing to trade for either. After this first expedition, Edward returned to Guienne for the winter. It should be noted that this was not simply an English expedition. The Black Prince had landed with only a small retinue, and so the majority of his forces were Gascons. When the campaign season began again, John was finally ready to head south from Normandy. And, being no shrinking violet himself, the Black Prince decided to march north. When the two armies neared, they maneuvered around each other for weeks. During this time, John managed to successfully cut off an attempt at reinforcement, and Edward had found a nice defensive position near Poitiers and had begun to entrench. Like at Crecy, John had a much larger force, generally estimated to be between two and three times the size of Edward's. And also like at Crecy, Edward's small force was in a well-defended position. Neither side loved their strategic position, so they decided to negotiate. Edward was willing to give sizable concessions for safe passage back to Guienne, but the bitter taste of the previous year's chevauchet had caused John to take up a hard stance in the negotiations, which ultimately caused them to fail. Both sides were beginning to run low on food, and so on the 19th of September, both forces readied for battle in the wee hours of the morning. Like at Crecy, the battle began with a duel between the French crossbowmen and the English longbowmen, and, also like at Crecy, the longbowmen won out. However, Poitiers would not be a beat-for-beat beat repeat of Crecy. The French knights were not riding uphill. Rather, many of the men-at-arms had dismounted and were approaching on foot, and the combined arms approach seems to have been more effective. While the French casualty rate throughout the battle was significantly higher than the Anglo-Gascon, momentum seemed to be on the side of the French. Still, though, Three waves of attack had not broken through the English line. John then ordered the Oriflamme, the battle standard of the King of France that ordered no prisoners be taken unfurled, and launched the fourth attack with his own division. This attack was close to breaking through the English defenses, and many in that army began to despair. However, unbeknownst to the French, a Gascon cavalry detachment had broken away from the rear of the English army, feigned a retreat, and was on their way to engage with John's force. All of a sudden, the army heard the war cry, Guienne! Guienne! And the dismounted French knights were struck from the rear by a full-speed cavalry charge. The French army then broke and fled, and the luck of the battle had fully swung in the opposite direction. 
The English were now on the offensive, and spent the rest of the day mopping up. The citizens of Poitiers, fearful of an English victory, had shut the city up, and now many of the fleeing French soldiers found themselves trapped between the walls of the city and the advancing English. Still, King John fought on. He may have been a bad king, but he was a gallant knight. In fact, an English chronicle wrote that, quote, If one quarter of his own army had fought so well, the French might have prevailed. During this last stage of the battle, John was accompanied by his youngest son, the 14-year-old Philip. John had ordered his sons off the field early in the battle in case of a disaster, but Philip had returned to his father's side, and in this last phase of the battle, stayed close to him, parrying the occasional sword blow and yelling, Father to the left! Father to the right! But warnings could only do so much. The king was in a desperate position. All around him, men were falling, including the standard bearer of the oriflamme. Finally, a voice called out in French that John must surrender, or he would be overwhelmed and killed. And so, John and Philip surrendered, and were taken to the Black Prince, where they were led back to Guienne, and eventually to England. John's oldest son, the Dauphin Charles, now acted as regent, and John's youngest son, for his courage and dedication to his father, earned a cognomen, the Bold. Now, we're going to leave Philip the Bold in England to enjoy his luxurious captivity so he can get acquainted with the last Capetian Duke of Burgundy, Philip of Rouve. We left the Capetian House of Burgundy with the death of Duke Odo IV. Odo had seen the position of Duke of Burgundy to new heights. He had continued the family tradition of increasing their landholdings in the duchy. He worked to refine and expand the power of his office. He had patronized artists to sing his praises and create lavish works for the ducal court. And most importantly, he had deftly played the game of matchmaker to bring in new territories and build alliances. And now, all of Odo's plans for the future of Burgundy lay with his three-year-old grandson, Philip of Rouve. Odo had a great vision of Burgundy, and during his lifetime had raised the power and prestige of both the office of Duke and of the Duchy, and he arranged for his grandson Philip to take them both even higher. Philip of Rouve was the culmination of generations of accumulating inheritances. As I mentioned a few episodes ago, the high medieval period had seen a shift in how lands and titles were passed down. As split inheritance was replaced by primogeniture, or inheritance by the oldest, usually the oldest son, the death of a magnate no longer meant that his lands would be split up and his power diluted. When combined with dynastic marriages and the occasional ending of a line, territory and titles were accumulating rather than dissipating. Philip of Rouve inherited the Duchy of Burgundy from his grandfather, the counties of Burgundy and Artois, as well as extensive lands in Champagne from his grandmother, and would inherit the counties of Auvergne and Boulogne from his mother. All told, this made him one of the largest magnates in all of France, and the power within the Duchy of Burgundy that his family had built up over the years meant that he could wield much greater control over his territories than most other dukes or counts, at least in Burgundy. All of this made Philip one of the most eligible bachelors in France, and his mother was determined to exploit this fact to further build the power of the family. She arranged for Philip to marry one of the most eligible bachelorettes in France, Margaret of Flanders. Margaret of Flanders was the only child and heir of Louis of Malle, the Count of Flanders and son of Louis of Nevers, who, if you'll recall, died at Crecy. Despite inheriting Flanders in a tough position, fortunately for Louis of Malle, he was able to come to terms with the English and assume the role of Count of Flanders in 1349. In addition to Flanders, Louis was also the Count of Nevers and Rethel. The match between Philip and Margaret was one that promised to unite two of France's most powerful noble families and had the potential to create another Angevin Empire situation. If you can't tell, this is foreshadowing. However, Philip of Rouve never had the chance to fully exploit his claims. In 1361, Philip of Rouve died at the age of 15, likely of the plague. Unlike most people of his age, Philip had made a will stating that all of his territories should go to their proper inheritors depending on local law and custom. While this will doesn't really seem like it said anything, it did have one important effect. It meant that his territories would not be subjected to escheat. 
or the annexation of his feudal overlord, in this case the king of France, upon his death without heir. Auvergne and Boulogne went to his great uncle, the closest living relative to his mother, and the counties of Burgundy and Artois and his Champagne holdings went to his grandmother's sister, Margaret, the mother of Louis of Mala. In an interesting turn of fate, there were two claims to the Duchy of Burgundy, John the Good and Charles the Bad. John was the son of Joan of Burgundy, and Charles was the grandson of her older sister Margaret. John argued based on proximity of blood, while Charles argued based on primogeniture. John had managed to strengthen his position by marrying Philip of Rouve's mother shortly before her death, and ended up acting as Philip's guardian after it. Going by Philip of Rouve's will and looking at Burgundian custom, Charles technically did have the stronger claim, but unfortunately for him, his flirtations with the English had alienated the residents of the duchy, who were proudly French and had grown to know John during his years of regency. So when Philip of Rouve died, John, who had been routinely updated on the duke's condition thanks to his own connections at and power over the ducal court, acted swiftly to press his claim, and the people of Burgundy accepted it. In the negotiations between the heirs of Philip of Rouve, John was able to win one more important concession. He was to be made the Count of Burgundy upon the death of Margaret. Once again, the House of Valois had won a battle of inheritance against Charles the Bad. John was able to press his claim to Burgundy because by the time of Philip's death, he was back in France. The four years that John the Good and Philip the Bold had spent in England were fairly comfortable for them. Despite being the leader of an enemy state, and despite Edward III's claim on his crown, John's status was not in doubt, and that is what gave him the best protection. In medieval warfare, peasants were killed by the dozens, but nobles could often expect to be captured and ransomed. It is difficult to overstate just how much this practice dominated how the nobles viewed warfare. To them, death was the exception, not the rule. Sources from the Battle of Poitiers even state that, in the last, desperate phase of the fighting, John removed his breastplate to show off his royal robes underneath, as he was aware that the fleur-de-lis on the latter provided more protection than the former. And so, as he was a captured king, France was forced to pay a king's ransom for him. John and Philip spent their time in England, traveling between different estates and living like the royals they were. While back in France, the breakdown of government had only accelerated after Poitiers, and the Dauphin Charles was scrambling to raise funds for his father's release and to hold back the tide of chaos. In France, the Dauphin faced two great rivals for power, Charles the Bad, who had escaped his imprisonment shortly after Poitiers, and Etienne Marcel, a powerful and influential member of the third estate of the Estates General. Marcel and Charles the Bad had conflicting visions for the future of France, but they made useful allies in opposition to the Dauphin. Marcel is an interesting figure whose career mirrors both that of Jacob van Artevelde and later the Jacobins of the French Revolution. Throughout the past few years, as King John was forced to raise more and more funds for armies, he was forced to call on the Estates General more and more, and in turn, the Estates General had become more and more self-assured. The Dauphin was still facing revolt in Normandy and English raids in the south, as well as the plundering of free companies, or bands of mercenaries that now had nothing to do after the break in the major fighting, and so was forced to give in to some of the body's demands in exchange for funds to continue the fight. These demands included a complete restructuring of the royal government, the dismissal of most of the Dauphin Charles' advisors, and the rise of Etienne Marcel to quasi-prime minister. John was able to negotiate a truce with Edward in England in 1357, but Marcel knew that the return of King John would mean his loss of power, and so used his influence to reject the truce, and so John remained in England, and the raids continued. Marcel was also able to exploit the growing resentment of the peasants and the urban working classes. The economy was still in tatters, and they now had the additional tax burden of a king's ransom. Additionally, they were being regularly menaced by the free companies, and despite his best efforts, the Dauphin was mostly focused on bigger fish. This was compounded with a general growth of disdain for the nobility, as the peasants were still forced to pay taxes to them, and many of which were going to pay their own ransom after Poitiers, and the knights had seemingly abandoned their duty of local protection. On top of the economic and violent hardships they were facing, the royal government was largely seen as ineffective and corrupt, 
Marcel's control of government seemed an acceptable alternative for many. Tensions boiled over in 1358 due to the meddling of Charles the Bad. Charles had spent the year or so since his release from prison menacing the Dauphin and attempting to take as much away from the central government as he could. He demanded that his seized lands be restored and that an indemnity be paid for him for the indignity of his, in his words, unjust imprisonment. Going even further, he also demanded the Duchy of Normandy and the County of Champagne. Whether or not the Dauphin was going to cave into Charles's demands is unknown, as during this time, word reached France that another truce was coming close to fruition. Charles was in his own secret negotiations with the English. He hoped to become King of France and replace his cousin John, or at least arrange some power-sharing agreement with Edward. The English rightfully saw Charles the Bad as an unreliable ally at best, and another potential and unpredictable rival. Edward realized that his claim to the French crown would be bitterly resisted by the French themselves, and that it was better to carve territory away from France rather than to try and annex the whole kingdom. He was thus willing to set aside his own claim to the throne and recognize John as king in exchange for as much of the old lands of Aquitaine and an enormous war indemnity. When Charles the Bad found out that he would not be able to rely on the English to back him, he realized that he was up against a wall, and ever the mischievous schemer, he decided to cause some chaos and see if he could make the best of however things shook out. Charles and Marcel thus allied with each other to exploit the resentment of the lower classes of France. Charles threw open the gates of the prisons of Paris, and a revolution had begun. It is reported that during the street fighting, the mobs of Paris chanted, Ghent! Ghent! An homage to Jacob van Artevelde and his own radical toppling of the comital government in Flanders. One of the reasons that I compared Etienne Marcel to the French revolutionaries is that both exploited the resentment of the lower classes to force through political change. Marcel led a group of Parisians to the Dauphin and they ripped two of his advisors limb from limb in front of him. The Dauphin was suddenly a prisoner of Marcel and Charles the Bad. As violence was breaking out in Paris, it was also erupting all throughout northern France, as the peasants had finally had enough and decided to take out some of their hatred on the nobility. This revolt, known as the Jacquerie, was then supported by Marcel and the streets of Paris. However, this support would eventually lead to Etienne Marcel's downfall. The reason that this revolt was called the Jacquerie was because Jacques was a kind of derogatory catch-all given to the peasants by the burghers and nobility kind of like a more insulting Joe Sixpack, or how incels call anyone with the barest of social skills a chad. Not all of Marcel's support was among the lower classes. In fact, burghers and nobles opposed to the Dauphin made up a significant portion of Marcel's party. However, after the assassination of the Dauphin's advisors and the intense violence of the Jacquerie, many of these better-off supporters suddenly saw the Dauphin as the lesser of two evils. Additionally, Marcel and Charles the Bad began to fall out during this time. Charles, a high aristocrat himself, had no love for the Jacquerie and really just wanted to be king. Marcel, on the other hand, seems to have wanted to use the Jacquerie as a military movement and in doing so, rid himself of Charles and his supporters and possibly proclaim a republic. The Dauphin was able to escape from Paris and set up his own base around 50 miles away. There, he was able to accumulate forces. Charles, as was his habit, began secret negotiations with the Dauphin to induce the mobs of Paris to surrender in exchange for a large payment and exemption from punishment. The King of Navarre, however, was unable to hold up his end of the deal and was forced by the mob to lead them in battle against his own forces in the city. But ever the schemer, Charles instead deliberately led the mob into an English ambush and was able to flee in the confusion. Charles then set his sights on the Jacquerie and crushed the peasant rebellion, more out of self-interest than loyalty to the crown, as he was one of the largest landowners in the areas that the revolt was burning brightest in. By this point, the Dauphin had gathered enough support to march on Paris and force Marcel out of power and bring order back to the city. However, the Dauphin's problems were not all fixed, as the free companies were still roaming and the English were about to launch another chevouche. This chevouche plundered all throughout Burgundy, and the destruction it caused was a big contributor to Burgundy's refusal of Charles the Bad's claim on it. In response to this raid, the French launched one towards England, 
The fighting continued at a relatively small scale, but at this point, both sides were exhausted and wanted peace. Edward agreed to take about half the territory he initially demanded and reduced John's ransom by a quarter, and in 1360, the Treaty of Brittany was signed. Edward now controlled a bit over a fourth of France's territory, and John was able to leave England. As a collateral to his ransom, John sent his son Louis to London as a hostage. Unfortunately for Louis, as France was still being ravaged by the plague, the free companies, and a weak government, the process of raising funds took a while. In 1363, Louis had had enough and escaped from England and returned to France. Earlier in this episode, I called John the Good a bad king but a gallant knight, and his response to his son fleeing London is really all the justification that I need for this claim. John was enraged and felt that his honor was besmirched, and so, rather than appreciating the return of his son or even just ordering his son back to London, John declared that the only way to restore his honor was to return to captivity himself. Despite all the problems still facing France, and despite all the difficulties that his son the Dauphin had gone through as regent, to attempt to raise his ransom, his mind was made up. Honor mattered more than all of that. So, before we ship John back to England, where he will be lavishly received and honored, hmm, maybe that's why he wanted to return to England. After all, his reign was kind of a disaster, and he had no true responsibilities in England. Let's take a look at how he spent his years back in France. I already mentioned John's seizure of Burgundy and rivalry with Charles the Bad there. What I did not mention is that upon his return, John pardoned Charles the Bad and restored his lands, so when Charles returned to his antics, we can lay one more thing at John's feet. And when John won out in Burgundy, Charles decided to raise some trouble again. John, however, did not seem to care that he was once again alienating his powerful and unscrupulous vassal. He had his eyes set on using the rich and powerful duchy to reward his youngest and likely now favorite son, Philip the Bold. Upon the father and son's return from England, John granted Philip the duchy of Touraine. But Touraine was not enough for either Philip's ambitions or for John's gratitude. So when John acquired Burgundy, he saw the perfect appanage for Philip, and so the Valois would follow the Capetians in Dijon as in Paris. Additionally, due to the particulars of Philip of Rouve's will, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to incorporate Burgundy into the royal domain. So in 1363, John made Philip his lieutenant general in Burgundy, and later in that year secretly invested him with the duchy. If Burgundy wasn't enough of a prize on its own, John decided to go even further. Burgundy was not given only to Philip, but also to his heirs. And furthermore, Burgundy was to be exempt from all royal rights in the duchy. Philip need only perform fealty and homage to the kings of France. John also made Philip heir to his claim over the county of Burgundy, and Philip was made first peer of France, which made him the preeminent vassal of the king. Again, it's clear which son was John's favorite. But when Louis, who is now likely John's least favorite son, returned from England, John left the kingdom to his sons and let them deal with the fallout. Now that we have Philip invested with Burgundy, going forward, I won't be dealing with French affairs quite as much, so we won't be getting into a play-by-play -play of Charles V's early reign. However, there are a few more threads that I want to wrap up in this episode most notably the inheritance claims of that scheming king of Navarre. In 1364, shortly after John returned to London, Charles the Bad decided to once again stake his claims on Normandy and Burgundy. He raised a significant group of forces, mostly from the ranks of the free companies, and decided to split them into two armies, which would march on each duchy. The Dauphin, no doubt incredibly annoyed that he had to deal with the plots of the King of Navarre yet again, began preparing for a defense. The invasion of Burgundy ended up being abandoned, and both of Charles the Bad's armies ended up heading to Normandy, where they would face off against a royal army led by one of the great generals of France, Bertrand du Guesclin. Du Guesclin was able to turn the tide against Charles the Bad, and yet again the King of Navarre was thwarted in his plans to carve up France. Right as the Dauphin Charles was getting news of this victory over the forces of Navarre, he was also getting news that John the Good had died of disease. 
Honestly, I feel like Charles must have been more relieved than anything else. In the past few years, his father had generally just made messes of things over and over again, and his time in England created a complicated political situation where Charles never really knew how much power he had. But now, the king is dead. Long live the king. One of Charles's first acts as king was to confirm the Burgundian investment of Philip the Bold. The brothers had always been on good terms, and Charles knew that he needed a powerful ally in the region. Charles went even further than John did, and actually expanded Philip's lieutenant generalship to the dioceses of Autun, Chalon, Langres, Lyon, and Macon, further increasing his power in the area around Burgundy. And in exchange, Philip conceded that Charles could levy royal taxes in the Duchy of Burgundy, and furthermore in the County of Burgundy, which was technically outside of France at the time. However, this wouldn't take effect until after the death of Margaret and his own assumption of the county. So for now, we're going to leave the four sons of John the Good in charge of France. Charles V was king, a position that he had at the very least some practice with at this point, and was determined to rebuild as much royal authority and influence as was possible. Louis, whose flight from England had precipitated John's return, held Anjou, Maine, and Philip's former appanage of Touraine all three being tucked in northwestern France between Normandy and Brittany. John held Berry, Auvergne, and Poitou, primarily holding power in south-central France, and Philip the Bold held Burgundy, and was on his way to holding much, much more. I know the last few minutes of this episode had a lot of French names and locations, and I apologize for any that I butchered. Next time, we're going to cover Philip's early reign in Burgundy, catch up with Flanders, and follow Philip as he searches for love. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice, and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me on twitter.com slash Burgundy or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website at granddukesofthewest.com. I've been doing some work on the website whenever I get the time, and it is slowly improving. I now have my sources listed for each episode, so if you want to learn more, be sure to check them out. And be sure to come back in two weeks for episode 7, an episode in which a Valois Duke of Burgundy will finally be the main character.